Hi, everyone, and welcome to our third installment of Painting Edo at the Arnold Arboretum. My name is Molly Ryan. I'm the Programs Manager at the Harvard Art Museums, and I'm delighted to have you joining us on Zoom this afternoon. Today's program is a collaboration between the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University and the Harvard Art Museums, inspired by the special exhibition Painting Edo, Japanese Art from the Feinberg Collection. Over the past several months, we've gathered together online to observe artworks from the exhibition alongside the living collections of the Arnold Arboretum and invited you to marvel at both the beauty of these plant species and the remarkable accuracy and spirit with which the artists of the Edo period rendered their botanical subjects. In today's program, we're excited to take a closer look at the magnificent Japanese black pine. Um, so before we begin, I just want to say a word about how you can participate in today's program. Um, we're using the webinar format in Zoom, so you'll notice that your cameras are off and your microphones are muted. Um, and instead, we invite you to submit questions to the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can submit your questions throughout the presentation, but we'll plan to turn our attention to these in the last 15 minutes or so, um, and we'll plan to wrap up by 3 p.m. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Pam, who will kindly introduce our presenters for today. All right. Thank you, Molly. I'm Pam Thompson, Manager of Adult Education with the Arnold Arboretum. And just a bit about the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, the Arboretum is a 281-acre public park and research collection of woody trees, shrubs, and vines located in Boston, Massachusetts. The plants we grow have been collected and propagated from around the world's temperate zone. The plants are grouped by family so that comparisons between species can be easily made. As with museums that display objects, incredibly detailed records are kept about each plant, how it was propagated, its current condition, and from exactly where in the world it was collected. The Arboretum was founded in 1872 and designed by landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted and the Arboretum's first director, Charles Sprague Sargent. The landscape is open 365 days of the year from dawn until dusk and is free to all. And parking has been made available once again along our perimeter roads. Our speakers today are Rachel Saunders and William Ned Friedman. Rachel Saunders is the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Curator of Asian Art at the Harvard Art Museums, where she is responsible for the Japanese collections. Rachel is a specialist in medieval narrative and sacred painting. She has recently curated the exhibition Painting Edo, Japanese Art from the Feinberg Collection. William Ned Friedman is the eighth director of the Arnold Arboretum in its nearly 150 year history as well as Arnold Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard University. A botanist who has devoted his entire career to studying the evolutionary diversification of plants, as director of the Arnold Arboretum, Ned is responsible for stewarding, promoting, and sharing the extraordinary botanical and horticultural resources of the Arboretum with students, scholars, and more than 250 plus 250,000 plus annual visitors. It's probably up uh, closer to 500,000 annual visitors at this point. Um, our first speaker is Rachel Saunders. So please welcome Rachel Saunders. Thank you, Pam, for that uh, introduction. And hello, everybody. It's really wonderful to be here with you today. It still seems kind of remarkable, even after all of these months on Zoom, that we can have more than, I think, more than 300 and 20 people at the moment together in this moment, all together in Zoom at, the, at, the, at this time. So the painting that we're going to spend some time with today is installed in our special exhibition, Painting Edo, Japanese Art from the Feinberg Collection, which opened uh, earlier this year and is now temporarily closed. But you can still access it through a variety of digital avatars, um, including I think we have now nine videos on our Vimeo page here. Uh, we have an online Google exhibition, an exhibition web page, and uh, programming like this. There's also a catalog of the exhibition available from Yale University Press. Now, the exhibition includes over 120 works of art from Japan's early modern Edo period, which is 1615 to 1868. And while it does offer a history of Edo painting, the more important aim 
uh, was to attempt to offer an immersive experience of seeing a little bit differently. Now we've long known that Edo artists were extremely interested in the depiction of the natural world, uh, but what I hadn't quite realized was how significantly my own vision <clears throat> of Edo painting would be altered by the experience of looking at certain works in the exhibition through the eyes of expert plantsmen like Ned, who's with us today, and the Arboretum's Keeper of Living Collections, Michael Dosman, with whom I took a very enlightening tour of the exhibition just after it opened in the spring. One of the things I took away from that is that the art historical visual literacy that is at the, uh, at the core of art historical practice and botanical literacy are both premised on keen observational skills. Uh, one in the museum we often emphasize as close looking or slow looking. And this is perhaps a bit of a self-evident truth, but um, it was an important one to, to articulate. And more importantly, perhaps was being shown how this kind of collaborative looking from different disciplinary angles can present some welcome challenges to what we think we know and how what we think we know influences what we see. So the painting that we're gonna spend some time with today is this one, this ink pine by Ito Jakuchu, who's a celebrated uh, Edo period painter born in 1716, passed away in 1800. And we can date this wonderful painting by the inscription. Uh, to about 1796. So the painting itself was produced very late in his life. It's a hanging scroll format painting, as you can see, and the painting proper, so just the, uh, the part right here, is about a meter tall and about 40 centimeters wide. So I think it's about three feet, three, four feet tall and about a foot wide. It's almost completely monochromatic. It's painted in ink, just uh, black ink on silk. So what are we looking at here? So if we start um, from the sort of the point of view of compositional makeup here, what I think we're looking at is a pine tree that's been painted from extreme proximity. So if we could start at the bottom uh, left-hand corner of the painting here, and we can follow this big limb that uh, extends up here to the mid right-hand side of the painting, and then it disappears. It's as if there's so much energy in this pine that it cannot be constrained within this narrow painting plane. And it shoots off out uh, beyond the edge of the painting plane here. And uh, in my mind, what I think is happening is it's going beyond the painting plane and it's sort of, I hope you can see the arrow on my screen here. Can you see that, Pam? You can, good. Okay, so I think it's shooting off here to the right and it's coming back somewhere from above like this. And so we're coming back into the picture plane, back into the composition and following it down to this kind of gradually attenuating branch that's getting thinner and thinner and thinner. Then it shoots off again out of the left-hand side and loops round until we get to the very, very end of this twig here. It's incredibly delicate. There's actually no ink there at all. And so we actually end up in a position that's not that far from where we started. Uh, so we've got a sort of big, uh, double loop going on here. And it sort of gives you that sense of the energy of the tree. It's not, you can't constrain it within this narrow window-like um, aperture that you're looking at it through. And that gives it a sense of, it, for me at least, an incredible sense of intense proximity. It's as if the tree is kind of embracing you in a way. You're so close to it. You're not, it's almost as if what we're getting is um, a subjective experience of being embraced by this tree rather than being presented with a picture of a pine. If we go in a little bit closer, there's a different kind of proximity we can get to with this tree. And that's because it's painted in ink on silk. And ink is very different than oils. If you um, put your brush down with ink on it on silk and you make a mark, that mark is forever. You can't take it away. You can't rework it. It's there. And uh, one of the wonderful things that that means is that 200 years later, we can still see the traces of the artist's hand, of the traces of his brush. Uh, right here, as if, as if it had been done yesterday. Uh, for example, if we look at the structure of this branch here, we can see that the artist put his brush down here and that it was fairly dry because we can, we've got these sort of split bristles coming off the end of his uh, brush stroke here as he moves the brush this way. And then if you can see, the brush has been moved this way. It's been moved across the, pit, the, the, uh, the silk and then lift it up here. There's the tip of the brush there. It's been lifted away from the silk. So we've got brush stroke one there. It's a little bit like an upside down seven. The brush has been put down again here to, to form another stroke here. This is the center of the branch. And again, we've got some of these slightly drier bristles lifting up as the pressure of the brush is altered down the stroke. And then 
there's a slightly rounded end to this stroke here, as if the brushes you know, had a little uh, pressure applied, the bristles have splayed out a little bit, and this time the brush is removed here. This is where all the bristles are taken off, just at the end of the stroke there. And to complete the branch, we've got one more stroke that comes down here. Again, we've got these slightly drier split bristles here, probably a bit more pressure on this side than this side. And here we go. This is where the lifting up happens. This is the end of the stroke right here. So even after you know 200 years, you can still see the pressure, the direction, the decision making that was going on in the hands of the artist right now. Um, so this is the branch. The other thing I wanted to point out about here is these dots right here and here. Now, in the context of a pine tree, you might like to think of those as some kind of um, indication of lichen, perhaps, or moss. That's one way we could read them. The brush tip's been used here. Perhaps the side of the brush has been used here to create different shapes. In the context of ink painting, uh, conventional sort of rhetoric, visual rhetoric of East Asian ink painting, what I thought of immediately was these dots here. Uh, this is a very famous uh, canonical example of an ink painted landscape. And um, if we go in a little closer, you can see there's these little dots that have been used as sort of conventional way of texturing um, rocky or um, mountainous landscapes. And so that put me in mind of that a little bit. Now, while we're in more conventional territory here, I want to take another look at uh, a painting from the Feinberg collection. This is one half of a pair of screens by Kano Sansetsu. And the reason I wanted to show you these is there are some amazing trees in this screen, and that could be another whole talk, but it's this one in the center that I want us to look at, because we have another pine tree here. And this is more what you would expect to see of an ink pine. You'd expect to see this kind of angular branches, uh, there's a little broken branch here, or some knots here, and then we've got the pine bristles or needles um, formed in these sort of circular cartwheels right here. And what's important here is that it's easily identifiable, identifiable as a pine tree, part of the rhetoric of ink painting and these um, wonderful rocky landscapes. Now, we have a look at the needles in Ito Jakichu's pine. They look very different. We've got these very spiky, brushy, dry, um, spindly needles uh, going on here. They seem to be in sort of pairs, uh, left, right, left, right, left, right, um, that sort of complement each other. And another thing you might notice <clears throat> is that around each of the needles, in fact, around a element of the pine tree, uh, is this kind of white halo of silk that has been left in relief. Now that's been done by the application of a sort of bluish wash across the whole background of the painting to leave this kind of little area of relief around the elements of the pine. And to me, it sort of suggests um, a sense that the pine is backlit, that it's maybe illuminated by the moon, something like that. Uh, so these are the these are the needles, um, and uh, in the center here, Ned, what would you call this? This element here, this sort of candlelight protrusion. I don't have well, the name for that. It's funny that you should say candlelight because uh, the short uh, sh some of the shoots uh, when you have them uh, uh, off the main branch are referred to as candles in pines, and I'll show some pictures of that. But it could be an old dead uh, shoot that no longer is growing at its tip and producing needles, and it's just left behind. It doesn't fall away. Huh. Oh, great! So I didn't know what to make of that, but it, it sort of it looked pine-ish to me. So. <laughs> um, Let's move on to the last element that I was going to take a closer look at. And it's this part of the painting right at the bottom. And that's uh, this limb, whether it's the trunk or a major limb of the tree, I'm not sure, but it has this incredible curvature going from the bottom left, as I said, out to the sort of middle of the center right of the painting. It's almost like a sort of bridge or a rainbow in a way, the way it's moving. And we have these incredible um, scales, the sort of plate-like areas of bark going on. Both, of the, both sides of these sort of um, these areas of plate like bark seem to be flanking this great white gash in a way, which um, maybe some kind of opening uh, in the tree, maybe some damaged tissue perhaps, but um, seemed utterly legible to me as a pine, but I wasn't able to articulate what that might be in words, I have to say. Perhaps, perhaps Ned will refer to that kind of um, characteristic later on. But to me, what it looked like was with the sense of these scales, and then the sense of movement, there's just a feeling that you're shooting across this painting here, um, that there's a kind of litheness, a sort of almost writhing aliveness to this trunk. It's not static for me in any way. 
combined with these scales, it put me in mind, perhaps a little fancifully, but of, of the idea of you perhaps glimpsing the belly of a dragon, sort of mystically making its way through the sky, something you could never really see. Um, and it turns out that Jack Chu did in fact paint dragons. Uh, this is a rain dragon. And as you can see, um, again, Jack Chu's used the same technique here of extending beyond the picture plane. This is another being that cannot be contained within its painting. Um, I mentioned Moonlight earlier, and perhaps that might make a little bit more sense in the context of uh, another painting by Jack Chu. This one was completed in the last year of his life, so not, not so long after the, after the Feinberg painting. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's a pine that's being lit by this uh, rising dawn sun here. So we're just sort of creeping sunlight, touching the edge of the, the pine here, and the tone of the background is much warmer. Um, it's a sort of reddish, bluish wash here. And this is a painting that would have been um, appropriate for display at New Year's because we have the dawning sun for the dawning of a new year. And we also have the pine, which was displayed at New Year's really for its symbolic value as a, a symbol of great resilience and uh, longevity, um, which is associated with its um, coniferous uh, characteristics, a sort of sense that it, it's evergreen and that it can grow into these very contorted shapes that make it look, or make it look at least, uh, as if it could be very, very old. Now I've been looking at this pine, which is, I have to say, one of my favorite paintings in the exhibition. I've been looking at it really pretty gener generically as an, a so-called ink pine, as a member of the conventional ink painting uh, visual vocabulary of East Asia. I mean, it's a pretty dramatic example, pretty idiosyncratic example, but you know, a pine, nonetheless, I thought pine would do as a, as a, as a uh, identification. And I've been thinking about its symbolism and particularly its um, personification with the ideal of the, the reclusive scholarly gentleman and with longevity and endurance. Um, some of those things might come from some ancient word play. Um, the word for, for pine in Japanese is matsu. Uh, which is very similar in sound to words like uh, motsu, to maintain or to keep, as in to keep your needles or your leaves, uh, or matsu, to wait, to endure. But um, when I began looking at this pine with um, Ned and with Michael, they saw something more specific. Their way of uh, viewing this, uh, this image was enabled them to identify it as likely a black pine, or a kuromatsu in Japanese, or uh, Pinus Tumbergi, I think I think I have that right, um, as a, uh, which is also known in Japanese as an omatsu uh, or a male pine, which is characterized by this kind of dark scaly bark and um, quite bristly brushy needles, uh, as well as the, the propensity to grow in great curves. And in Japan it stands in opposition to the red pine or the akamatsu, which is known also as the mimatsu, which is the female pine, and it has this sort of reddish blushed um, bark and much softer needles. Um, as an aside, the Pinus Tumbergiae is um, named for the Swedish physician and uh, botanist who uh, traveled to Japan in 1775 and he later published Flora Japonica, which was the first attempt in Europe to categorize Japanese plants according to the Linnaeum system of binomial nomenclature. So uh, what did having this botanical identification in hand changed the way that I saw this painting. Well, it kind of set off a chain of thought that I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily have had, I think. And that is that rather than considering Jack Chu's ink pine from within the context of the conventional rhetoric of monochromatic ink painting, which is the general art historical logic with these things, uh, we might do better to look at it from a different angle and to look at it from the context of the really charismatic polychrome paintings that Jack Chu produced um, in the 1760s and which he's best known for today. And it's paintings like these. Now these paintings are truly overwhelming and they feel that they are absolutely bursting with vibrant life, um, really in part, well, I, in large part, I think due to their investment in a real, really kind of ferociously accurate observation and recapitulation of natural phenomena. There's a lot of surface detail here and it makes them feel as if they're just thrumming with vitality. Um, but somewhat counterintuitively, despite all that vitality, it's not coming from a sense that the animals or the plants are moving. It's coming from this attention to detail and sort of overflow. Now, art, in art historical terms, um, paintings based on this kind of um, visual rhetoric or symbolic economy that is behind monochromatic ink painting 
uh, often treated very separately or very differently than paintings like this, this more sort of descriptive polychrome mode of painting, which have an investment of some sort in empirical verisimilitude. But Ned's observations of this pine, um, the, the Feinberg pine, made me think that we might actually be missing a big trick here by keeping these things so separate. There's a sense of life, I mean, I'm really talking about the sense of life that's derived from this kind of intense depiction of detail is a trademark of Jack Chu's mature painting. And an important part of his artistic persona has been the sort of sense that he was very interested in drawing from life. He, well, a, lot of, a lot has been made of the fact that he came from a family of greengrocers and that he apparently kept chickens so that he could observe them every day in order to paint them. Um, but it wasn't really about the surface detail so much for Jack Chu. It was uh, more about uh, mastering the uh, essence of something in order to be able to paint it. And this is actually an inscription from one of his paintings. Flowers, birds, grasses, and insects each have their own innate spirit. And only after one has actually determined the true nature of this spirit through observation should painting begin. So it's not really about the external accuracy, even though we have that too, it's really about the internal spirit. Now, I mentioned Jack Chu's penchant for chickens. And here are his two, two of his best known chicken paintings. And I know we're supposed to be talking about trees here today. So just bear with me, we will come back to pines. But um, Jack Chu's chicken paintings are very useful for us because they've been investigated by uh, Melinda Takeuchi of Stanford University. And she really put to test the persona of Jack Chu as an empirical painter. And her findings bear out the fact that although Jack Chu made very acute observations, he would in fact combine and exaggerate highly specific elements from different breeds to create fantastical hybrid chickens that convey this uncanny sense of life. So um, according to uh, Professor Takeuchi, who knows a thing or two about chickens, um, she demonstrated how this amazing rooster is actually a kind of, who really feels very, very real. He's actually a hybrid of two different kinds of chicken in Japan and very distinct chickens. This, this one here, the shokoku chicken, with the amazing tail and the sort of rounded body shape and the big comb here. Um, and then this one here, this big fighting chicken that was imported much later and uh, not until the 17th century did this arrive in Japan. It's got this incredible stance with the legs and the very aggressive attitude, but almost no comb at all to speak of here and definitely no decorative tail. So she found that um, Jack Chu put together observations of these two real animals into this incredibly lifelike chicken here that to those of us who don't know anything about chickens looks very real. Now, I think what we're getting is that Jack Chu is prioritizing the sense of life um, using details that uh, he took from accurate observation of living phenomena. And that's a tendency that is not unusual in polychrome painting, but I think we could argue would be highly unusual in ink painting. So I think it's fair to say that um, Jack Chu's expertise in both polychrome and ink painting is pretty unusual. Um, and later in life, he does begin to produce ink paintings in quite some numbers. In 1788, he lost his studio in a, in a great fire and he was forced to relocate and to start painting for money again. And it's been speculated that uh, the need to paint for money was one of the impetuses be behind his return to ink painting. Nevertheless, it's been observed by Jack Chu experts in, that in the very last years of his life, which is when the Feinberg paint, pine was painted, his ink paintings developed incredible depth and an entirely original inventiveness. And there's a sense, I think, in these ink paintings that we're seeing something new. There's a sort of shorthand intensification of some of the features, this observations, very highly developed observation that distinguished his earlier polychrome paintings and that that is being translated back into the symbolic realm of the ink painting, of the ink idiom. We might get a sense of that here from a comparison of the, the, the rooster from the polychrome rooster from the 1760s with an ink rooster from the 17, well, from 1795, where he's using ink to capture the different kinds of feathers, the different um, areas, different textures of feathers here. And also this kind of wild, tail feather at the end that's just kind of spooling out from his brush right here. Uh, but thanks to Ned and Michael's eyes, we can now do the same with the pine. We can compare this polychrome pine from the 1760s, which is kind of overwhelming in the density and highly polished detail of its depiction with the Feinberg ink pine here, which was produced 
you know, 35 years later. In both paintings, we have the sense of kind of looming presence, but it's achieved in two very different ways. Here it's the, the surface detail and the density of the depiction. And here, I think it's in the energy of the brushwork, taking some of these features um, and retranslating them into, uh, into the ink idiom. And that's definitely something I would not have spotted if uh, we hadn't had the opportunity to say, this isn't just a pine, this is a black pine. Um, and that's something that would never come out if we hadn't been looking at these things together. So I think I should um, turn it over to Ned, who's gonna tell you some more about real pines. Rachel, before we do that, um, I have two questions very specific to the painting. Um, and that is what type of brush was used and what type of ink was used, if you know. Uh, great questions. Um, so in the, um, the Feinberg pine, uh, I think a couple of different types of brushes were used. It's often thought that those pine needles were done with a, a wide brush called a hake which would not have been a usual brush for using uh, for ink painting. Um, it, it's more utilitarian and it's quite rough actually. Type of ink, I, I couldn't say specifically, but um, very often it's uh, pine, pine soot that's used to make um, Japanese sumi ink. So it could be that. And did the artist use a resist to backlight the needles or? I don't know what that great, means. Great, great question. Um, that is really one of my questions. I think that this is very interesting because it's silk. And if it was paper, I would be more confident about saying, well, maybe this is one of the examples of the use of a special thick paper that Jackachu was known to have used. He used something called gasenshi, mm -hmm. um, which when you mark it with a brush, um, your brush and ink will, where you've touched the paper with the brush, that's where your mark will be. But beyond that, water will flow and it's just water. So you get this kind of amazing halo, this grayish halo around where your brush mark was. I don't think the same is necessarily true of silk unless you treat it in some very special way. So I was reading this more as a painting of that effect, that kind of penumbra that you get from using gasenshi paper um, in this painting. But that's something I would really love to investigate further. All right, thank you. All right. Well, Rachel, that was just wonderful. I, I mean, I, I, I really just came for to hear you. So I feel like uh, I could go on and ask many more questions, but uh, it really is such a magnificent thing for you to, to guide me and everyone else through uh, what are some of the, the, the real subtleties of this painting, which when I first saw it, I was really almost dumbfounded by how abstract it was, something from the 1790s uh, to be so abstract, uh, a representation of nature and the particularly uh, of, of plants. And uh, so it's been just wonderful conversing with you and with Michael Dosman, the keeper. Um, but before I get there, I wanted to update one thing that Pam mentioned about uh, the uh, quarter million visitors we get a year at the Arboretum. Arboretum. That's from a very old survey that probably is 30 years old that we don't actually need to use anymore because we actually have estimates. And since the pandemic began, we're somewhere north of 2 million visitors this year since the end of, of March. Uh, we have gate counters in the, on one gate and through that single gate since March 30th, almost 600,000 people have come to the Arboretum for respite uh, during the pandemic. So um, multiply by 10, Pam, and you're, you're, you're closing in on the mark. Uh, and it's been just thrilling for me to see so many people uh, coming to be in nature. Again, coming back to the fact that nature is part of the aesthetic experience. It's not merely scientific or uh, factual. It, it has a, a way of affecting the soul. So let's dive in. I, I, I just uh, think it's an amazing thing to, 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 to have this collaboration and I'm gonna share screen. So let me do that first and I will uh, start to talk about uh, our pines at the Arboretum. So uh, first I just want to welcome everyone to the Arnold Arboretum, the North America's uh, oldest public arboretum founded uh, in 1872 and uh, actually uh, part of Harvard University, but also incorporated in the park system of the city of Boston, free and open to all every day. Now, this is a 
nice aerial shot uh, with our mapping systems uh, of our 281 acres roughly defined like this and it's season appropriate you'll notice that there's very little green outside of our conifer collection or hemlock hill uh, so you'll get a sense that um, uh, we are greener in the summer but uh, we turn a different set of colors uh, in the fall and the winter the conifer collection is a, one of our largest sort of areas uh, in the Arboretum in terms of, of, of groupings. It's about 24 acres. And uh, I just want to show you um, if we were, we're going to come eventually to, to meet this Japanese black pine here, but I want to show you what it would look like if you were walking along Hemlock Hill Road. Um, you might look out, and I just took this little video, Sunday was magnificent in Boston, the, everyone was outside walking, and I just stood at the base of the conifer collection looking into the pine collection, separate from the spruce collection, the fir collection, the yew collection, and I'll just try, If some of you may not uh, get great uh, video if you have uh, low bandwidth, but anyway, this is just to give you some feel of what it was like uh, with people walking in the pine collection, the beautiful, you know, olive greens of the pine, and then Kent Meadow opens up as designed by Olmsted to give you a long distance view uh, towards uh, the uh, left side where you see our firs and, and our spruces. And actually some of you may recognize a Dawn Redwood, the first one outside of China ever uh, in the background. And if I can just sh uh, show you a couple of still shots, this is just looking into the pines. This is our museum collection of pines. This is just on Sunday. This is again looking across Kent Meadow. There's a beautiful uh, stream that passes through it. It's a very tranquil part of the Arboretum. And when I'm under the pines, I can tell you there is something quite uh, re quite specific to the experience of being there. Just as one moves from room to room in a museum of art and has a different feeling and different experience based on the art that surrounds you, the same is true with the Arnold. And here I am, and there's something about the dense covering of pine needles, of all these different species at the Arnold Arboretum. It feels peaceful. It's a little bit off the beaten path. So you find a certain uh, quiet, uh, and of course, it's so green no matter what the time of year. So uh, this was just Sunday. It was just, just a magnificent time to be uh, in the pine collection. Now, uh, Rachel mentioned uh, that uh, uh, this, the, a little bit of the background of the description of, of the Japanese black pine. And, and uh, I'll just mention again, Thunbergii is to uh, sort of honor uh, one of uh, Linnaeus's students who was in Japan for a little more than a year um, and who was the, one of the first people to describe this species. Uh, but actually he thought it was another pine. He thought it was a very widespread uh, sort of pine from Europe and Asia, which is Pinus sylvestris or the Scots pine. Uh, it isn't. And uh, in a later uh, uh, flora, Flora japonica of Siebold, who did after, who worked with a, a Munich botanist, Zuccherini, um, you see, we see the first illustrations in Western uh, science uh, of, of uh, this species. It was also misidentified as another species, but we now know that this is in fact our Japanese black pine from the flora of Japan by Siebold uh, and Zuccherini. Now, the Arnold Arboretum has a very nice collection of Japanese black pines. And there are three periods of our uh, museum acquisitions that I, I wanna just tell you a little bit about. The first was when uh, Charles Sprague Sargent, the first director of the Arnold Arboretum in 1892 made a trip to Japan. He was always fascinated by the extraordinary diversity of trees in Japan proportionate to its land area. It just was a very rich place. Uh, and we have some of his trees uh, that were collected as seed in 1892 still in our living collections. Then Ernest Henry Wilson, uh, who was one of our greatest collectors uh, of our early period of, of acquisition, uh, made uh, trips to Japan between 1914 and 1919, different trips. Um, and uh, he, we have some of his material and we'll, we will see that. And then uh, it would be a very long period of time, actually 1977, when a major expedition was mounted to Japan and Korea by Stephen Sponberg and Dick Weaver of the Arnold Arboretum, whom, whom you see on the right in our greenhouses. Uh, this is a picture, by the way, of Wilson in the middle with two of uh, his Japanese uh, colleagues uh, during one of his uh, trips to Japan in the teens. And that's a, a sergeant, not in Japan, actually uh, in the US, um, but as a young man. We normally see him with the gray beard and, and older visage. Um, and 
when uh, uh, Sargent had been to Japan and back, he actually published a forest flora of Japan. And it's worth noting that uh, in this flora, if you go and read it, you will see that it has uh, nice uh, descriptions. And he says, of the true pines of Japan, two species are valuable timber trees. These are Pinus densiflora and Pinus thunbergii. That would be the Japanese red pine and the Japanese black pine. Both bear an important part of the decoration of Japanese gardens, and one at least has its influence in all expressions of the artistic temperament of the people. So now we have a clue. And let me, oops. Of the two species, the black pine, Pinus thunbergii, appears to be the most commonly cultivated and to grow to the larger size. Of its distribution and appearance when growing naturally, I was not able to get an idea, as all the plants I saw had evidently been planted by man. Uh, it is of this species that the plantations of the coast are mostly formed. It's a coastal species, mice. Although the two species are generally found mixed together in all plantations. And it is this species which is usually selected by the Japanese gardener when he wants to make the branches of a pine tree cover an arbor or hang suspended over the sides of a moated wall. We'll be back to that. And which is found in every garden and is most revered by the Japanese. So we're beginning to get some clues from some very knowledgeable people uh, who were observing in the 1890s trees that certainly would have been alive uh, during the Edo period. And in fact, when Jakuchu, uh, Jaku, uh, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, but Jakuchu uh, was alive and was painting himself. Um, he goes on, it's one of the most picturesque pines with a broad head of stout contorted somewhat pendulous branches, often growing to the height of 80 feet, not always though, and producing trunks three feet though, through in dark, deeply furrowed bark, darker colored and thicker leaves and white buds serve to distinguish it from the red pine, uh, which is a tree of high altitudes and which although planted in large plantations and by the sides of highways does not appear to be such a favorite in gardens as the black pine. Now, Ernest Henry Wilson, after returning from Japan, he too published on the conifers of Japan. And here you can see uh, from Cambridge uh, University Press in England, uh, 1916, uh, he had very similar observations about the black pine. As usually seen, this black pine is a most picturesque tree with a crooked trunk, ponderous sprawling branches, dark green leaves, and a blackish looking crown of no particular shape. Its odd habit, umbracious withal, is probably what has so endeared it to the Japanese, by whom it has been more widely planted than any other tree except the cryptomeria. He goes on, it is certain that this pine has influenced Japanese art more than any other tree, as it is a familiar subject on their paintings, wood carvings and embroideries. The great highways of old Japan, like the Takedo, which stretched from Kyoto to Tokyo and the Oshukaido from Tokyo to Emori, uh, were lined with rows of this pine, the remains of which may be seen today. In the grounds of the daimyo's palaces, this tree was much planted, and in those of Nagoya Castle, some fine trees are still growing. In Tokyo, there's a picturesque group of this pine outside the temples in Shiba Park, and in the grounds and on the inner wall of the moat, which bounds the emperor's palace, there are many fine specimens. Stay tuned. In many places in Japan are famous trees of this pine, which the people make long pilgrimages to see. One might say to worship. Such, for example, are the extraordinary trees at Karasaki uh, on the shore of Lake Biwa, and the ship pine in front of the Kofujuju uh, temple at Nara. This ladder is about 28 meters tall, six meters in girth of trunk, and the lower branches, which form the prow and deck of the boat, are 50 meters long. And he goes on, when growing thickly together in forests, as on the Tanagea, Tanega Shima and protected from the wind, this black pine can behave like an ordinary pine tree and form a nearly straight trunk, spreading branches and a more or less oval or flattened crown. On Tanega Shima, these trees are from 20 to 30 meters tall, and he goes on to talk about measurements. But what he's revealing to us is that the form of the Japanese black pine is very plastic. It depends on how it's grown and where it's grown. It can be craggly and very angled, but if grown densely in essentially a planted forest uh, uh, with very, very large numbers of trees, it will assume a very sort of uh, typical pine-like form and, and, and ascend. 
So let's look at some of the pictures in our archives, all of which I might add are available on Harvard's online library system because they are uh, part of our digital uh, holdings at the Arnold Arboretum. Well, in 1905, uh, one of two Arboretum explorers, uh, this one Dutch, uh, Frank Meyer, was in Japan and records uh, our first images of uh, pines and probably Pinus thunbergii as annotated uh, in a temple in Nagasaki. And you can see them uh, here and perhaps overhanging. But at the same year, John George Jack, who was a dendrologist and a forester, also was in Japan. And he pictures here, uh, again, giving you a very good sense of its natural setting on the coastline. It's very salt tolerant pine. Uh, these wonderful black pines on an island in the bay at Shiogama. Uh, and this is 1905. I, they're beautiful, beautiful silhouettes. Uh, here you see a tranquil, tranquil scene. Uh, but also Jack made his way into uh, the villages and towns of Japan to record those very wonderful cultivated and worshipped specimens. And here we can see uh, in Tokyo this magnificent specimen. And by the way, I don't know that these are telegraph poles, but I suspect they are maybe also electric poles, but you're beginning to see quite a bit of information in this that you can unpack. And this is in August of 1905. And this is what happens when you really care for a tree and it's not necessarily being beaten back by uh, the winds of the coast and the salt spray. And here we see uh, John uh, Jack uh, at the Imperial Palace in Tokyo. Uh, remember we recorded both Wilson, I believe, and Sargent mentioned the plantings of black pines that overhung the moat uh, of the Imperial Palace. And this is August 29th, 1905. Um, but now look at these groves, these planted groves that would have been probably windbreaks and also probably used for timber. Um, this is uh, in uh, Numazu, uh, and um, I believe you're looking in the distance at Mount Fuji here. Um, and that is a very dense planting. This is not a natural setting of, of, of the black pine as a shelter bet, belt against sea winds. So you can see these very narrow uh, habits uh, of these pines, very different than what we see in the painting. But here again, uh, we turn to Ernest Henry Wilson in the 19 teens, 1914 in February, a coastal savanna, grasslands with the occasional trees. And we see a very different form of black pine uh, here in Yakushima. But one of the most magnificent portraits of a black pine that we, we hold, I think, at the Arnold Arboretum, one of my favorites, uh, taken in 1914 by Ernest Henry Wilson, is this tree of black pine. Here's the man for scale to give you a sense of the age. Was this tree alive when uh, Jack Chu was painting? Yes, it was alive when Jack Chu was painting, and it would have been of size even then. So we're looking at trees that could have been experienced by anyone who was an artist painting black pines uh, in the 18th century. And here are some of these wonderful uh, pines here at a temple. This is in uh, Nagoya Hondo, and uh, this is a uh, height 65 feet, Wilson records, circumference nine feet, always has the person there for scale. Uh, and these have obviously been sculpted by people who are, who are actually practicing an art form, uh, not unlike what you might think of with bonsai, but uh, this is, uh, these are very highly sort of uh, yeah, kept trees, I would, I would imagine. Um, but here we are out uh, here near a, uh, an, another place. This is in Kyushu. Uh, and you see a, a very lax kind of habit to uh, a very healthy, happy looking a black pine. Um, and here's another image of a black pine, a little bit more craggly, I would say. You can see some of the angled stems that we see in the painting here, some of the jutting of going back and forth we see here uh, in the crown. And, uh, and, and I think that that is something that the eye is picking up. Uh, and here's another one. Uh, this is uh, in Yakushima, and uh, again, a very large specimen, and you can see the coast and the water uh, behind you, uh, multi-trunked. But again, some jutting angles, some spiraling here. Uh, there's great movement, I would argue, uh, much as Rachel described, as the tree went off the canvas and came back. This is one of the famous ship pines that was referred to in the writings I, I read earlier uh, from Nara from the Kofu uh, Juki Akuji uh, uh, temple. Um, and you can see the props holding up the lateral branches, the low, beautiful things that are supposed to form the, the prow of the ship. Um, and this was taken in 1914 by uh, Ernest Henry Wilson. This tree certainly would have been alive 100 years and more uh, beforehand. 
And um, he came back the very next day to take the tree from another angle. So you can see uh, April 23rd, April 24th, he came back as a study to really pick up some of the form of this tree. And I wanted to show one last image because this takes us out into their natural environment. And this is uh, near Matsushima, a hondo, a remarkable cliffs, uh, Wilson describes, of gray sandstone with Japanese black pine. Quite craggly, quite small, dwarfed uh, essentially by the fact that they are exposed to sea salt and the storms uh, throughout their lives. And, and really a remarkable sense of what it means to take a toehold and persist uh, through the most extreme elements of living on the coast, uh, as these pines do. So now let's talk about our collection, our museum holdings at the Arnold Arboretum. Um, our first accessions actually predate our going specifically to Japan. Through correspondence, we uh, had a relationship with the Agricultural College of Sapporo and received our first seeds of Japanese black pine in 1880. Over the last 148 years of our existence, we have had uh, 76 Japanese black pines accessioned in our collections. And of those 76, 17 of them are currently alive and on the grounds today. So unlike uh, the uh, accessions that uh, Rachel uh, is so uh, careful about at the art museums, um, we do lose accessions. Sometimes they get hit by lightning. Sometimes they're killed by disease. But I will also show you that we have ways of extending their life even when they're declining. Uh, most of our specimens are from Japan, but I should tell you that the Japanese black pine actually is also a native of the coastline of Korea, where it would have a different name. Uh, in terms of its common name. Um, and uh, we have a few specimens that were collected uh, from Korea. But I love this trunk here of one of our old accessions. You can see this was collected by Wilson, Ernest Henry in 1919. Right off the bat, you're seeing something that's pretty uh, clearly not growing up very well. Uh, it has some rather extreme angles at the trunk. And it's, right, it's on Peter's Hill. It's one that you can easily see if you come to the Arboretum. And over the years, as many of you know, I've taken uh, well over, well, many, many thousands of images that live on our online databases of our trees. I just like taking pictures. I always take a picture of the tag of, uh, of every tree I, I photograph so that I have the accession data uh, that goes into our databases. And these are the, of the 17 living trees. One, two are from uh, Sargent's collections that I photographed. Uh, here we have four from Wilson's collections two from the Sponberg and Weaver uh, expedition uh, to Japan and Korea, and then actually one that we received from uh, the Morris Arboretum of the University of Pennsylvania, where they went collecting for Japanese black pine in Korea. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of our trees, and let's see if we can evoke some sense of what Rachel has just walked us through. Um, here is the base that you can see again, and they, they tend not to grow very straight in our cultivation. Uh, this is a, an 1893 specimen that would have been collected in 1890. Uh, two by Sargent. You're starting to see the plate-like, do you see these plate-like structures that bark exfoliates? And when it pops off old pieces of bark, you see these patterns. This has less of a patina here. It's a fresher uh, sort of tan as opposed to the older patina of older bark that hasn't been exfoliated. Uh, here you can see really this, these very plate-like structures, which I think are evocative of what Rachel has shown us uh, in both the color and the ink uh, images that, that were, that were uh, uh, shown of the pine, uh, and they look very different than the other species of pines you would see uh, in Japan, uh, mostly the, the Japanese red pine and then the uh, Japanese white pine. And if you come to the Arnold Arboretum, I wanted you to do exactly, we have a wonderful uh, new uh, mobile application that can tell you about our trees. This is my favorite Japanese uh, black pine. And I'm going to play a short video. Uh, I want you to do ex uh, feel what Rachel described, which is what it means to be literally embraced. And I didn't know she was going to do this. Uh, so we didn't actually practice with each other beforehand, but I felt the need to be embraced by this tree. And this is going to be a video I'm going to play. Uh, again, apologies if it, if it stutters a little bit, but I have many still images beyond this. And I just want to just take you from this Japanese black pine. This is right off of the conifer path. Um, it, it was collected, we know from our extraordinary records in Nagano on January 29th, 1919. It came to us as a seed, and it's now grown into a nice 
uh, very old organism uh, celebrating its 101st year at the Arnold Arboretum. And as you can see, we're starting to see the jutty needles that are not so delicate. Um, they're a little rougher, and I, I, I can believe that the male uh, sort of a, a attribution of this species matches um, the sort of angular all elbows kind of feel that you have when you're, you're in the, the canopy. You see the remarkable twists and turns of the trunk uh, here being represented. And again, the plate-like nature of the bark. You see plate after plate after plate, uh, each as you move up uh, this trunk here. Also covered with epiphytes, plants that grow on others. This is all mosses and lichens. And I suspect that perhaps some of the uh, symbolism uh, that we're seeing in these uh, 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 wonderful paintings by Jakchu are in fact the epiphytes, the closely observed lichens and mosses that grow on bark uh, in the right uh, environs. And I'll show you some more of that. But now I'm just looking at the wonderful, this is a two needled pine. That means each fascicle or bundle of needles has two needles. And you can see that right here. There's a pair of needles right there, a pair of needles right here and uh, the shoot tip. But again, you see old dead needles in the background, a lot of crossing over, um, uh, but very bold looking, uh, not soft, I would argue. So I'm immersed in this pine, I'm underneath it. It's just grown this way. We haven't done anything to encourage it to do that. I'll show you some other features that I think are, are of note uh, in terms of attribution to Japanese black pine, but I wanted to just finally lift you up into the canopy here. Uh, to give you a little bit more of a silhouette. These little candle like, they're called candles or these short shoots that have these sparse needles, very characteristic of this Japanese black pine. And I wanted to give you a silhouette because we are comparing to an ink painting, which is a monochrome, even though I have a blue sky behind. Uh, it's a magnificent specimen. And um, I just show you again, some of the angularity of the stem, the trunk, uh, that we see here, the very plate-like nature of the uh, bark at, that will exfoliate over time, the mosses and the lichens I'll show you later. This is just looking up into its canopy. And again, it has this very, I, I keep saying elbows, but that's what I think of when I, when I look at it. Here's another specimen from 1977. You can see if we don't plant these densely in essentially a forestry orchard, they, they have a tendency to go every which way but up. And uh, so this is not a particularly old tree, but it's already uh, sort of uh, making sure that it's, it's not growing uh, uh, straight up. Here's a close up of the bark again with these beautiful plates of bark that I think are being picked up. You can see the fissures between them. They're very well defined and, and uh, quite characteristic uh, of, and different, for example, than the Japanese red pine. And this I just took on Sunday to, to, to sort of examine the question of what was on the bark. These are lichens here. These are symbiotic relationships between fungi and, and either uh, photosynthetic bacteria or green algae. And these are all mosses. And part of the reason bark exfoliates is to sort of shed you know, the stuff that, that can tend to sort of get too thick on you. But you can see this is slowly accumulating with age. This is newer bark, so it has fewer uh, mosses, but you can see this beautiful texture of greens and light greens. Uh, and if you look up close, as I tried to, this is all moss in the foreground, and these are all uh, wonderful lichens in the background uh, growing on this Japanese black pine. Also characteristic, but not something we can see in the painting, is that the uh, terminal buds of the shoots tend to be very white, and that's, that's unusual and different than what you would see in the other Japanese pines. Here you can again see the uh, little fascicles of two needles per bundle. Uh, here are the pollen cones in the spring before the leaves merge for the next flush um, they'll, that are gonna rain down yellow pollen. I have a fascination with the cones that come out in the spring, but if not again in the paintings, but these are the future. It takes two years to mature pine seed cones of, uh, of our Japanese black pine. They come out a brilliant red. And here you can see in the spring, the new bundles of needles that are going to emerge from these ensheathed cases. Uh, and here you can see these wonderful young pine cones. Uh, and these are the needle bundles. And I'll show you just as the needles emerge, there's a pair of needles, there's a pair of needles, there's a pair of needles and these will all flush out. So there's an incredible aspect to the ephemeral sort of leafing out. 
And the cones will, again, they're absent, I believe, from anything in our paintings that we're looking at. But here is a younger cone uh, from our, one of our 1977 trees, uh, beautiful green uh, with these things. These are called umbos if you're a pine person like I am. And um, they eventually turn brown, the scales separate, and eventually the seeds are shed. So you get a sense of, of, the, of the pine through the season. But I want to call your attention to something. After the fascicles, the bundles of needles are shed, they typically live three or four years in black pine, and then they, they are left uh, to uh, be deciduous. There are these very prominent scales, and these are different than the other Japanese pines, which have much smoother stems. So here are these two pairs of one needle and another needle and what we call a fascicle. But there are these very, very uh, apparent bracts that become woody and uh, the needles are just gorgeous. I just think they're, they're just, they, on a sunny day, they glow, uh, especially when they're young. But do you see these bracts? They're, they not only subtend the fascicles, but they're along this portion where you don't have needles and they are persistent. And I wonder if these are some of the nubbins that are being observed in the painting. I can't be sure, but it, it's really quite apparent. And here we are reading this branch. All of the uh, nubbins here are actually small scale leaves, but they're woody and they persist for years. And it makes for a very, very rough surface on these older uh, narrow branches. Um, and you can see again, you get these waves of needles, you get a cluster of needles, then you got a lot of nubby bracts. Cluster of needles, that's two-year-old needles, nubby bracts. Three-year-old uh, fascicles, nubby bracts. Four-year-old fascicles, and then you begin to see that the main shoot here has no more uh, fascicles of needles, they've been upsized. But the lateral shoots have, have come forward. So I just took this shot uh, because it, for me, it captured something in, in this painting. Um, it's the angularity, it's the roughness of the stems, um, it's not the plate-like nature of the bark, but to me, I can't say for sure that this is the Japanese black pine, but when I was Im immersed in or being held by this Japanese black pine, it evoked the, uh, the beautiful paintings that, we, uh, paintings that we were looking at today. So uh, that is really all I wanted to share, so I'm going to stop sharing, um, and hopefully I've at least convince some of you that there's there's some interesting things to to synergize between the world of art and the world of plants. All right, thank you, Ned, and thank you, Rachel. Um, so we do have some questions. First question, Ned, um, from Poland, um, <laughs> wondering if um, Thunbergii was written on. Um, not Sarge, yes, on Sargent's notes, they were, it was written with a capital T. Was that was. standard of his time or not? It, it was, it was not, a, in, in his publications, it would not have been italicized. And because the, the binomial included the name of a person, it was given a capital T. So that is exactly right. Okay. Nice spot. Thank you. So I, I always, when I transcribe, I, I try to maintain the original. Uh, so a great, great catch. Okay, all right. Um, and the trees, that beautiful photograph of the trees out on the rocks um, in the sea, are those, were those planted, do you think, or do you think they were seeded in by wind or birds? I think those were natural. I mean, Sargent was re really referring to the fact that so much of it was planted. Mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, I, I don't remember all the details of his trip and how, how much time he spent on the coast and we don't have images. But those look to me to be very much natural. I mean, forestry was very highly developed in, in Japan very early. So you have a lot of plantings. And again, this was an important commercial timber. So it was being grown to build buildings for hundreds of years. Uh, but those look very natural. Uh, whether they seeded in from plantations or not, I, I couldn't say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, lots of compliments on this and just scrolling back through. Um, is there a cause for the angularity in growth, those elbows, as you say? Well, I, I know there's a cause. Um, and I'm ashamed to say I'm a plant morphologist. And I've thought really hard about this. And I don't, I don't know whether it has to do with various aspects of shoot death in the way that, for example, when you terminate a shoot, you have regrowth from what are dormant buds. There may be angularity to that that just uh, sort of ends up giving you these characteristic bends. 
Um, but I think that that's my best guess. You have shoots growing, uh, the terminus dies for whatever reasons, could be broken in a storm, and plants leave this pool or residuum of, of lateral shoots that are in bud form. And when you lose your terminal, and many of you will know this, if you've ever clipped a hedge or a tree, you get a sprouting of all these dormant buds. Um, the angles are going to be specific to species. In a general sense, we have architectural rules. So that's my, my best guess, but uh, it is truly a guess. Okay, do you want to take another guess here? Um, how old do you think some of those 100 foot uh, black pines are that were shown? Oh gosh, I, I would imagine, you know, several hundred years old. Um, I would probably want to defer to sort of the knowledge of the temples, for example, mm -hmm. where they were grown. Uh, there probably are good records, but um, they're certainly grown to great size and those trunks suggest uh, they're not young trees. Mm -hmm. They're also very well taken care of. So, um, um, they also might have grown rather vigorously. These, these plants can grow pretty, pretty fast if they're happy. They won't at the seashore necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would just probably go as far as, you know, certainly well over 100 years could easily be two or 300 years, but that, that'd be as far as I'd go. Okay. And now someone is asking, are these black Japanese pines the same ones found on our islands that are being killed by disease? Those well, would more I mean, likely be native and not Japanese black pine, correct? Uh, I'm sorry, on our, when we say our, our islands, which- I'm where, assuming where, she means New England islands. Um, uh, well, uh, it, interestingly, uh, they were considered to be something that should be planted as a sort of shelter uh, because they're very salt tolerant. Um, I don't know whether there, there are many of them around New England, but they certainly were brought over with the idea, again, that they were a particularly useful uh, planting near the coast. Um, they're not one of the most disease susceptible uh, pines that you can get, um, but there's so many things now that are moving around the world that are attacking plants. And, and actually Michael Dosman uh, speculated and when, when Rachel and I were talking with him um, about that white scar along the trunk uh, in the paintings, both the color and the ink, that he thought that might have been evidence of, of disease, of some sort of a canker. Uh, which is a really interesting thing. And, and I, 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 otherwise it's somewhat uninterpretable uh, because unless it's symbolic of something uh, totally different. So, uh, yeah. Okay. And now for you, Rachel, um, someone is saying that typically a ground color is put on first, but what you were saying is that he applied the gray wash after he painted the pine and then left the white area as negative space. Is that correct? Right. That, that's what I'm suggesting. I'm not um, willing to say it 100%. As I say, I think we need to investigate it further. But I, I don't think um, laying in the background or the, uh, what this person's calling a ground color mm. would have been feasible for this painting, unless I'm misunderstanding the way it's been laid down. I'm reading it as an evocation of an effect that comes naturally out of ink painting on paper that I think is being replicated on silk here. Um, it is a kind of specialist technique that uh, Jack Chi was known to use. Um, the uh, scholar Yoshiaki Shimizu, is a, a, I coined the term sujime gaki for it, which is um, split ink technique. And that's where water bleeds beyond the um, boundaries of an ink um, image. And we don't, we're not talking about outlines here, kind of what you might think of as an outline here forms naturally um, as a barrier when the ink hits the, um, the surface that you're painting on and um, goes as far as it's going to go. And then it sort of causes a viscous barrier to, to form naturally. And then anything that goes beyond that um, is, is, um, is what we're talking about in terms of um, split ink technique. So a little bit of water bleeding beyond the the, um, the edge of the ink is, is natural on paper. I'm just not convinced that you would have gotten the same effect on silk. Clearly, silk is a, is a more prestigious material to paint on. And these, uh, both this image in the Feinberg collection and the one with the sun that I showed you, which is in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. they're both on silk, which is an interesting choice for an ink painting anyway. More usually you would find them on paper. Um, so I think there's definitely something going on there and it needs a little bit further, further investigation. Okay. Um, and again, for you, Rachel, when the artist needed to paint for money again, why 
did he go to ink paintings? Were they more desirable than the polychrome? Uh, great question. I think um, I'm speculating here, but um, I'm imagining that he could produce them more quickly. Mm. Uh, it's less labor intensive. I mean, it, I'm not saying that the skill is any less because as I said, you put any mark down on, um, on silk or paper and that's it, it's there. So you, you're sort of talking about however long it takes to produce an ink painting, which I don't know, maybe we're talking a, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes plus 55, 60 years of experience. So um, it may well be that that was a really great way to um, meet his needs at that time. Um, yes, they're certainly desirable, um, but painting, the, the polychrome paintings that I showed are actually from a set of 30 paintings, all of that level of detail. They're absolutely spectacular. And they are occasionally shown all together. Um, they were created for funerary services at um, a temple named Shokokuji uh, in Kyoto. I'm sure there are pines there. We should go check it out. But um, they are amazing when they're all put together. But they're an incredible labor of love. And they took over a decade to put together. So I think you're probably going to be able to produce ink paintings more quickly, more expeditiously, um, if you're needing to pay for money, mm. if oh. you're able to. <laughs> Yes, if you have that skill and talent. All right, um, Ned, back to you. How long does it take for the pine cones to grow from tender red to dried and opening up? Is that all in one season or more than that? Uh, it, it, it's not. Pines are, are take their time. Uh, the seed cones of a pine actually are on a two-year cycle. So spring of year one, uh, you see these wonderful red cones uh, uh, in May, uh, typically, uh, maybe late April. And they will grow to a certain size and then go dormant uh, at, at, in the fall. And they overwinter. And then the second year, they really grow to size. They become very green, as you saw. And, uh, and then uh, in the fall, they start to turn brown. Uh, and really in the fall and winter, the, the scales separate. And these beautiful winged seeds, they actually helicopter down in the wind. Uh, which is a dispersal mechanism that has been hit upon many times by plants to fly like a helicopter um, is, is when they'll be dispersed. But all pines are on a two year cycle. So somewhat different than, for example, spruces, which uh, you would have a cone come out in the spring and it would mature uh, in the fall. All right. And are Japanese black pines available commercially in the US for residential planting? I would think so. They're very beautiful. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I would encourage anyone to Google them um, mm -hmm. and uh, and find out. Uh, there certainly are plenty of, pl of Japanese black pines that have been planted, and so you don't need to import uh, material from, from Japan to have access to it. There might be a burst of plantings of Japanese black pines after the <laughs> program. Well, I, you know, I think and if you start to read about Japanese gardening and uh, you do, uh, there are many fine Japanese gardens, uh, of course, in Japan, but even in America, there are like in Portland, there's a very, uh, uh, I think a fine Japanese garden there and there's one in Seattle, but you'll start, you can start to read up about the incorporation of the Japanese black pine into garden schemes based on traditional uh, Japanese uh, gardening. And uh, I think you'll find there's some really wonderful resources. Great. Well, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we are well past 3 p.m. So I want to be sure to let everybody um, go off to their next thing this afternoon. Um, so I just want to warmly thank Ned and Rachel for this fantastic, rich, uh, beautiful presentation. I think we all learned a lot. Pam, thank you for so thoughtfully choosing questions. I know we didn't get to everyone's and I do apologize for that. Um, but in closing, I just want to encourage people, if you're in the greater Boston area, please visit the, the conifer collection at the Arnold Arboretum. Um, the Arboretum is open every day from sunrise to sunset, and it's free to visit. Um, the Harvard Art Museums will remain closed through December 31st, and we're not sure about um, when we'll be able to reopen to the public um, and reopen this painting Edo exhibition. Um, but we encourage you to continue to engage with it um, through our online resources and stay tuned on our website for more updates um, about when we might be able to reopen. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Rachel, Ned, and Pam. Um, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your afternoon. All right. Thank you, Molly.